I'm going to be your guide through this adventure we call golf. And I'll make sure you stay in your lane. And then you can really have fun with the nuances of the game. How do I hit this ball off this uphill lie? What adjustments do I have to make to my setup to be able to lower the trajectory by 10% to be able to fight this wind? Or how much more club do I need because it's 50 degrees instead of 75 degrees? Or I'm playing up in Colorado, what's my adjustment to the altitude? The nuances of the game. Where's my ball gonna land on this chip shot? Is it gonna go down grain or into the grain? Is it gonna skid before it spins or is it gonna spin before it skid? What's the ball gonna do? All these things have helped you turn fours into threes, fives into fours that really help you score and play your best golf. We don't spend enough time on that because we're worried too much about how to swing the golf club, and that should be taken care of when you're set up. Hi, this is Ryan Wilden from Staten, Oregon, and I play golf at the St. Dan Golf Club. This is Golf Smarter number 875. Internet Information Overload. How to dissect and use what applies to your game with Josh Sander. This is Golf Smarter sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Josh. Thanks for having me back, Fred. Always a pleasure to be be with you. It's good to talk to you as well. Happy Hanukkah, happy December, happy holidays to you and your family. Thank you. I hope everybody's well. Everybody's good. We're ready to uh, take on some cold weather and then... uh, Enjoy the holidays. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, God, your kids must. Your kid must be getting tall, big, and yeah, hitting the ball. Right. Yeah, Both. did he have a good season? Um, yeah. So uh, the my kids are now almost fourteen, almost twelve, and uh, um, but not not really golfers. My uh, my son is um, a rock star soccer goalie. So the World okay. Cup was a lot of fun last uh, this past month, and um, so he's doing great with that. And my daughter's playing basketball and volleyball, and uh, there's a little bit of golf in there, but most uh, most of the other sports right now. I'm sorry to hear that. He'll come back to it. I promise. Yes, <laughs> I, I promise. Know, yeah. like, like I've been telling him, like they, all the all the good athletes do, they do their sport, and then eventually they all come to golf. So uh, he's got a nice base, and she's got a nice base, so they'll they'll get to it when they're ready. Good. Good, and I'm sure you're not the kind of dad going. No, you did that wrong. You've taught too many people to know it's better. Actually, it's actually so fun just to be able to support them with their other activities and not feel like I have to be the instructor. I'm I'm an instructor to plenty of other people. I don't have to be the instructor to my kids, so it makes Good. for a much better relationship. Good. Yeah. Well, you'll get to that point. Just you had a couple years away, but you go from being a manager to a consultant. Yes. <laughs> That's when you just have to let them make their own mistakes. It's I'm a hard like thing for parents to do. Be the supporter. That's what yeah. I want to be. Be the, the cheerleader on the side. Be your supporter, absolutely. Absolutely. So now that, that winter is really uh, getting to be in full force here, um, it's interesting. Uh, what do people do? You know, like we get to play a lot because we live in California and hoping to get more and more rain. It's been nice to not be able to play because the rain is coming down and the courses are muddy and I'm a weather wimp and don't like walking in mud, so I won't play, so I'll deal with it. But that's okay. I just think about all our brothers and sisters in various parts of the country that only get to play four or five months a year, and I feel so badly for them. Well, they appreciate it that much more when they get to play. That's for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And we just get cranky about it. But so what's interesting, though, people seem to be moving away, um, hopefully not forever, but there's these move towards getting these in-home simulators and going to places like Top Golf, where they have rooms dedicated um, and bars that are designed to just have these simulators. And they think that they're playing golf. They're playing a video game, though. <laughs> Yeah, well, they're they're playing their version of golf, and it's bringing more people into the game. And I haven't heard a single person who hasn't said, "Boy, we went to Top Golf and we had a blast!" Right? So it's a, I think it's a great addition to the game. It gets clubs in people's hands. Hopefully, some of those people decide, "Hey, I'd like to spend you know three to five hours in a beautiful place like a golf course and actually go play some golf with my friends." And and Top Golf is one activity, and playing golf is another activity. But uh, I think they'll, I'll think they'll both uh, feed into each other. So I think it's a good compliment. Yeah. 
Well, you know, for those people who go out to Top Golf and have a blast and more power to you, we love it. Uh, don't think that you can immediately go out to an 18 hole golf course. Find your local nine hole course yeah. right. and go get your chops in there before you start. Because right. some people get really cranky with new people on the right. golf course. Yes. Yeah. I was like, you don't want to be stuck behind that group of uh, four top golfers who decided, hey, let's go. Let's grab those no. beers over to the golf course. <laughs> yeah, right. Or, or the, you know, like I'll go out with, with a, but either by myself or with just one friend. We'll go out as two. So maybe we had fixed up with people are like, yeah, we're just starting to play. It's like, oh, this is going to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is going to, this is going to be entertaining. And well, it's my today, job to, to get those people out there being functional so you can play with them. Yes. Thank you for taking that job. We appreciate yeah. it very <laughs> much. So, um, interestingly, in your job of being a golf instructor, I'm fascinated as to when, uh, like, if somebody comes to you that may have done more than top golf and may have played a couple of nine holes or even played golf a couple of times, a lot of people think they shouldn't get golf until they learn how to hit a ball, right? Or they shouldn't get fitted until they 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 groove their swing. It's like, oh no 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 no, you're you're coming out of backwards here, you right? Know? Get fitted first, and the clubs will help you immediately. Yeah. Right? Your swing is going to be your swing. You just have to learn how to to groove it. So as an instructor, when you see someone coming to you for the first time, how do you decide whether you're going to be teaching the swing, uh, course management, the mental game? You know, what elements of the game and where do you, you know, how do you assess what you're going to do first with them? Well, I think that's where the interview process comes in because um, there's so many different avenues that you can enter in to a relationship with a student and figure out hey, what what you really want to get out of this. Because my my job is my job is not to put my agenda on you. I want to understand what your agenda is. What what are you looking to do with your game? Are you looking? Uh, this morning, I had a conversation with uh, with uh, a guy who's a plus two. And he's like, I'm looking to play some local tournaments. I'm not looking to, you know, be a touring pro, but I want to be competitive as a, as a local amateur. You know, so that's one conversation. There might be another person who's like, well, I just want to not embarrass myself at the corporate outing. Uh, another person, I just want to play golf with my husband. I, so so there's all different levels. And, and my job is to understand what the person's goals are. And then I can tailor the instruction and the experience to that. And I make sure before I start every lesson is to really ask them, you know, what what do you what do you want to do with your golf? Like, uh, what's I mean, why are you why are you playing golf? Why have why you decided to take a lesson? You know, and the the quite the answers are very different from person to person. And then one of the things I do as a skill just for myself is I then after listening to them repeat back to them. So if I'm hearing you correctly, you're interested in doing X, Y, or Z, and then I know I have buy in because they're like, yeah, this is what I'm here for, and and we can start a relationship where we can trust each other and like, okay, I'm going to help you get to where you want to go. And some people might have unrealistic expectations. Some people, you know, and that's part of the coaching coaching experience is, is to be able to to guide them through, you know, the path they need to, to go through in order to get to where they want to be. And some of them may not be realistic about, hey, I want to, you know, I just took up this game and I want to be a scratch golfer by the end of the year. And I'm only going to practice, you know, once once a week. I was like, okay, well, let's 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 think about this. In my experience, I've been doing this for 30 years now. I haven't seen that happen yet. Not to say that you couldn't be the first, but I hope you're an extremely talented person to be able to do this and oh, disciplined. And disciplined. I once had yeah. a guy who came to me, and he was a he was doing some business school um, classes at Stanford, and and he's like, you know, I'm just I'm fairly new. I've been playing golf for six months. Um, I'm 23, 24 years old. I have some time on my hands. I want to see if I can make it on the PGA tour. And I was like, okay, so let me, let me, let me, uh, ask you a few more questions. And, uh, it turns out he was a world-class sprinter who broke his leg just before the Olympics. He was going to run for Canada. And this guy's amazing amount of club head speed, just whipped the club through the zone. Like you wouldn't believe I'm like, okay, well you just passed the first test to be able to play on the PGA tour, which means you need to have speed of power. Right. I'm like, okay, now all of a sudden this is not unrealistic, not completely unrealistic. Um, because this guy has a huge skill that you can't really teach when you're 24. You've either, but at that point, you either have speed or you don't to be able to play at the highest level. 
you can always increase it. I mean, Bryson showed that, but the, I guess the, 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 the short answer to your question is it depends, right? What, what the, per, what the person really wants to get out of it. Right. And the way I look at it, and, and I know we want to get to this today is we're living in an age where there is information everywhere. There's information on this podcast, some great speakers that come in and, and uh, spend some time with you. Um, there's information on the internet. There's information in magazines. There's friends giving you advice. There's instructors giving you advice. And one of the things I tell my students is, let me be your guide through this world of information. Because not that the information is, not, not that some of the information is wrong, it just might not apply to you. And if you start going down these avenues of things that don't necessarily apply to you, because let's say, uh, well, I watched Charlie Woods at the PNC and boy, he does something looks just like Rory. And it's like, okay, well, does this apply to you? Um, I can tell you whether it does or not. Um, and if it does, we can go there. But if it doesn't, it's a waste of your time and it's going to make you worse. And it's not because the information is bad. It just doesn't pertain to you. So... I think one of the big challenges that we have, especially newer golfers, uh, this generation of golfers, is they have access to all this information. And what do they do with it? And how can they simplify it and say, what out of all this stuff, what applies to me and how can I make it simple so I can actually be successful? And I think the role of the golf instructor these days, a huge role is to be able to guide people through all of this. And one of the things I tell all my students, whether I'm teaching them online or whether I'm teaching them in person, is once they have their formula, like now your job is to put the earmuffs on and not listen to anything else and stick to this plan. And I can't tell you how many lessons when, that, that I give are just getting people back to their original plan. And, yeah. and it had gone off on some tangent because, you know, I open up my, my emails in the morning and I've got 30 emails from some golf information company sending me a newsletter with tips and, and it's like, oh, this is a thing. This is a thing. I mean, I can, and, and the thing is I, I as an instructor can sift through that stuff and say, okay, this, this is applicable. This is not, this is irrelevant. This is, oh, this could be really good. Great way of thinking about this. Good cue to help me do X, Y, or Z. But, but, but the, the lawyer out there, the doctor out there, the, you know, the, the, whatever the web designer out there is looking at that going, Oh yeah, let me try that. Oh, let me try that. And they come to me and it's like, well, God, I'm, I'm a mess. I, I'm <laughs> paralyzed with all this information. Right. And then we have a whole industry of sports psychologists and other people, as many of you, many of whom have been interviewed by you on this show, we're like, okay, let me get this person mentally quiet so they can actually perform. My job is part of that. Part of it's like, well, if you just do this little part, this is your this is your thing, right? So, um, Mike Adams has done a great job of helping instructors assess their students to understand biomechanically how they're designed to swing, and and doing that measuring, which literally doesn't take more than about two to four minutes. Uh, once you get used to doing it, is is a great way to understand their their personal blueprint. So I feel like I can't really help somebody until I've done those assessments. Somebody can say, I need a quick Band-Aid. I want to be able to play, you know, in this nine-hole tournament tomorrow. Uh, what can I do? I might be able to give them a little tip to help them through the day, but if I really want to get them on the road to playing their best golf, injury-free, and the most consistent they can be, I need to measure them to understand how they're designed to swing the club. So they're not working so hard to make their swing work. Okay. A um, lot to unpack there, but we're going to take a time out and we'll come back. And I have a couple questions about just what you said before we move on to the next topic. We'll be back yeah. right after this. There is so much to unpack in what you just said. Um, and I don't know whether to start at one end or the other. Um, I, but I'm fascinated. In, in your interview, part of asking people what they want to accomplish, when a woman says, I, when, a, when a person says, I just want to play with my spouse, 
do you then meet with both of them and then tell the spouse who's the player? It's like, okay, here's your role in this because you've got to walk with, you know, re- you got to wear a very delicate glove in this thing if you want to continue to encourage your partner to play with you. Right. Sometimes, sometimes I get that opportunity. Sometimes I, sometimes I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't require it. Um, but there's a, there's a, an art to coaching a student, oftentimes a woman, um, because they tend to get advice from everybody. That's yeah. just, yeah. Um, the nothing, mansplaining thing. But yeah, exactly. Um, and it's all with, you know, a good heart. They're trying <laughs> to help you. Uh, my, what I say to them is like, if they're a lawyer, ask them for legal advice. You know, if they're a doctor, you can ask them for some medical advice, but, but they haven't spent the amount of time that I have nerding out on golf and understanding how any little thing you do will affect what the next shot's going to do. It's literally, but you that, know, they're going to argue with you on that. Like I've been playing golf my whole life. I know exactly what's going on. Well, so, so I have one student who, who I've coached her to, you know, be nice to her husband, but to, to kindly say, Hey, I'm working with Josh and this is what he has me doing. Right. Great. Now it turns out, she keeps saying, well, my husband keeps giving me advice. And then when she tells me what the advice is, I'm like, nine times out of 10, it's not anything she needs. Yeah. And, and one of my other students who's a woman who who played with her husband, they played kind of a, a couple's golf day. And it turned out that this woman was asking her husband after she had a bad shot, what did I do wrong? So it wasn't even him giving her advice unsolicited. She was soliciting the advice when I had asked her to say to actually politely decline anything he had to say. So like, oh, so here's the reality of it. You were actually asking. And so here I'm going to give you the cause and effect. And part of the lesson is like, hey, if you hit this shot, this is what you're going to adjust. If you hit this shot, this is what you're going to adjust. And kind of give them a, you know, a, it's kind of a self-coaching thing. And you know, it's hard to adjust on the golf course, but she needed to understand the why without having to ask somebody else for the why. So, hmm. interesting. So, yes. with all this information, that I love the idea of of you know we're we're well obviously we're being bombarded by information, and I contribute to that wholeheartedly uh, because it was about information for me the the start of this thing, and it just kind of got out of control. But I've learned so much, and I and I think that I'm able to, you know, I'm able to make it apply to me. Um, I, people ask me regularly, aren't you overwhelmed with the amount of information that you have? And it's like, absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely on inf- information overload a lot. And so I just try to find a nugget or two on any conversation that I have. Um, but with all that advice that's coming in and you're saying, let me figure out what's relevant when applies to you, which I think is amazing and phenomenal. How do you assess all that information without being judgmental. You know what I'm asking? If that uh, makes sense? It's not even a matter of being judgmental. It's like your body works this way or it doesn't. Right? And yes, with some training, you might be able to add some flexibility or add some strength. But the bottom line is you're born a certain, or you, 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 you've grown to a certain height. You have a certain wingspan. Your bone structure is a certain, a, a certain length. Um, your, uh, um, your grip naturally goes on the on the club in different ways. So I always I always make sure that their hands are on there the way they're designed to be on there. I don't like the terms weak and strong grips. Strong connotes something that's good. Weak connotes something that's wrong. Um, that would mean that Ben Hogan and Roy McIlroy's right hand grip is, which is weak in our vernacular, is actually uh, not a not a good thing or not a strong thing. When actually biomechanically, it's extremely strong for them. So everybody, everybody's different. I remember going to, when I first started getting into the golf instruction business in the early nineties, back then we were, we were looking at, uh, at, uh, I was looking at, uh, PJ coaching and teaching summit videotapes of past speakers and, um, looking at all these amazing instructors. And there were some panels that, that were on there and I watched this one panel and it was, the, the, the interview was asking each one of these top teachers, what's the most important thing in the golf swing? 
or what's the most important thing in instruction? And the first teacher said, it's the grip. And I'm kind of rolling my eyes like, hey, you know, it's the grip. Come on, that's not, that's not as sexy as pressure shift or weight transfer or swing plane or wrist angles and all that kind of stuff we like to talk about. Like if your hands are not on there the way they're supposed to be for you to hit the ball solidly and straight, then the rest of your swing is, it, it is a compensation for something that you didn't do correctly to begin with. And we all like to see beautiful Adam Scott type swings where they're right on plane. But Jim Furyk's swing has been just, just as successful because biomechanically it's exactly the way it needs to be for him. If you measured him, that's how he's designed to swing. I had a student the other day, I won't mention his name, but a nice high school student. You would look at this swing and you would say, Matt Wolf's swing looks average, looks technically perfect compared to this kid was so outside flying elbow wasn't even a strong enough term the elbow was just way up to the sky made jack nicholas elbow look like he was tucking it a uh, massive plane change coming down with a lot of external shoulder rotation and when he finished his swing his feet were a foot further back away from the ball than when they started and he smashed the hell out of it dead straight and he's seen my instagram videos and talking about how i measure people um through the mike adams system and and he's like this you're the only instructor in this area that i can trust because you're not going to try to make my swing look on plane you know fundamentally neutral neutral grip uh, and i'm like you know what you are when i measured you you came out to exactly the way you swing the golf club and please don't let anybody change you i tweaked one little thing in his grip to make his club face be correct but everything else, I'm like, now just absolutely let it rip. Give me all you can. Do not try to hold anything back. And the harder he swung, the farther and straighter he hit it. And it was exactly how he was designed. You would never look at this at this swing and say, that is a way to swing a golf club. And it was, it was I mean, it's been one of my favorite lessons. Um, I saw him about a month ago. And it was like... I, I had to save his swing on my phone because I'm like, I just chuckle every time I see it because it's exactly the way he's designed to swing. And then there'll be somebody else who comes to me and they they measure out as being somebody very neutral. And it, it'll look like a like a uh, a an Adam Scott looking beautiful on plane, you know, that kind of a... The, the things we like to look at because they're aesthetically pleasing. Right? Um, I think what's aesthetically pleasing is a ball that's hit solidly with the correct trajectory and the curve that you predicted to happen before you hit the ball. That to me is beautiful. And how that happens is different for everybody. How you grip it is going to be different for everybody. How much stance width you have, what your foot flare is going to be. Um, if your swing is going to be more upright or flatter, it depends on how you're designed. If you've got shorter arms, you're going to have a flatter swing. If you have longer arms, you're going to have a more upright swing. You have longer arms, you're going to have to stand taller because that's how the geometry works. So your posture is going to look like you're barely bent over. Somebody with short arms is going to need to bend over quite a bit. They're going to swing around their body. They need to bend over to be able to hit that ball. So everybody looks different, but all the great players and the great player, when I say great players, somebody who has played really good golf for a sustained period of time. And I find that those players either were matched well i would say either figured it out almost on their own with maybe a little bit of help from a pro um but were headstrong enough not to change when somebody wanted to make their swing look different because that was their model right it's the jim furick i I had i don't know if i've been told you the story before but i was um at a conference and there was a guy who was a teacher there who played on the same team at arizona with jim furick and and he was like the number six or seven player, so he wasn't traveling. He was kind of frustrated. But when Jim got there, um, somebody told Jim, well, you got to change your golf swing because you can't play college golf with that swing. And he started trying to change it and couldn't break 80. And so this other guy got to go traveling because he was like the number five or six guy got to move up a spot. And then the minute Jim said, to hell with this, I'm going back to what I, you know, how I won all those junior golf tournaments, back to the swing that's made him into a Hall of Famer and a major championship winner. He said he wouldn't shoot over 70 after that. A bad <laughs> round might have been a 72. But he was shooting somewhere between 65 and 70 because he was doing what he's designed to do. So if you get measured, which 
happens with every one of my students, whether you're online or, or in person, um, I measure you before, um, you will know what your, blue, what your blueprint is. And if you know right. what your blueprint is and you stick to it, then you can ignore all the other noise out there, all this other information, which may be good for somebody, but not for you. Now you can make golf super simple. Now you go to a sports psychologist like, well, how do you play your best golf? Well, I, I don't think too much. Well, they're like, oh my God, well, you it's like, it's like the, the story of Fred Couples when he went up to uh, Dr. Bob Rotella and asked him, you know, all my friends are seeing you, should I see you? And and he goes, I don't know, Freddie, what uh, what do you think about when you hit an eight iron? And he goes, well, I just think about the best eight iron. Well, you don't need me. <laughs> it's, uh, it's like, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, because you, we, you know, I, I think I did a video the other day where I said, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a puzzle solver. I figure out what your pieces need to be and I can put you together in the way that you're designed to do it. Right. So, so then you can keep it that simple. And all of a sudden your, your mind can be quieter. So psychologically you're in a, in a state of peacefulness. I think, uh, you had, uh, uh, you are, you are, uh, one of your interviews was, was with, a. Uh, um, a neuroscientist who wrote that book, Jira Golf, right? And he said, "Quiet, a quiet Justice. mind is how we perform our best. Well, if you're trying to manage your swing because you're not doing what you're biomechanically designed to do, then you got a whole bunch of noise in your brain. And it's hard to be in a state of flow or zone type state, as we like to say, because you're, sit you're seriously, you're managing yourself through an entire golf swing and you're you're grinding so hard to make this thing work that's not really designed for you. Because ultimately, what you want to be able to do is get up there and rip it and not worry about it. But you have to be in the position before you do that. That's why that guy on that panel who said, you've got to have the right grip for you. I don't know if he said that, but grip is the most important thing. Yes, the right grip for you is the most important thing. And right. if you do that, it sets up so many things. Just the, just the trail hand grip affects the club face, the path, the attack angle, the linkage of how your arm matches your body and the direction of how your wrist hinges. So if that's off, that's already five things that are going to be messed up in your swing that you have to manage. Try doing that with a quiet mind. That is not going right, to work. Listen, we're going to take another time out. I'll be yeah. back. I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'll be back right after this. I need to get back to this young phenom. <laughs> I have questions about this kid. Is yeah. that I, I'm so fascinated. It's like when you when he took his first swing, yeah. and he was going through the swing, and your eyes are like, your eyebrows are going up, and you're like, oh boy. And then he made contact, and the ball just exploded out. Do you need to like take a step back and go, wait, do that again? <laughs> Let me. Well, how many what? times did he take? Did he have to swing for you to like, oh, oh my God, this is legit. It didn't surprise me because I measured him and I'm like, nah. this is what should happen. Now, it was a bit surprising that he actually did that because I figured that he would probably be doing something that he, you know, looked at, you know, like a beautiful, quote unquote, beautiful backswing that yeah. we're trying to feel like, like look at Tiger's backswing. Well, Tiger measures out to be pretty close to neutral in a lot of things, so it's still looks very neutral. Um, I got another another story about about tiger that we could talk about um maybe we already yeah. have the show but but um, you know listen i i don't care if you repeat stories because i actually think you've told that furic story before but i love it and there's yeah. people who haven't heard yeah. it before and so so this is all good so Please. when i measured him one of the measurements we do is called the trail hand grip measurement and um when he did that and i assessed it, i'm like no seriously do it the way i asked you to do it he goes he does it again, and, and he did it a certain way, which was like pretty extreme. I'm like, wow, so you are a big time, what I call it, uh, and Mike Adams is going to cover a golfer. And so I'm like, so that's somebody who, when they take the club back, is going to have their elbow way out like this instead of tucking it like this and holding the tray like we've talked about before, right? Mm -hmm. His elbow's going to be like that, so you can imagine where the club's going to be. Pointing, I mean, elbow way up here, club way over there, and I'm like... Well, this is cool. Let me measure how much your uh, your shoulder externally rotates, and he's got a lot of external shoulder rotation, so that's going to shallow the shaft. I'm like, okay, let me see this, and it did exactly what it was supposed to do. And I'm like, cool. 
Now your balls look going a little bit to the right. I need to strengthen your left hand grip to match up your club face. But now just go ahead and do it. And literally, it's one of those lessons where think about how much work for a golf instructor to take somebody's biomechanically that way and try to make them into a neutral swing. They're going to be doing some serious, what my old mentor Jim Hardy says, some serious physical therapy throughout the, throughout the entire swing. That is a hard golf lesson. This one was one of the easiest golf lessons I ever gave. I strengthened the left hand grip a little bit. And the harder he swung, the farther and straighter he hit it. Amazing. Like now, now it now it's like there's no, there's there's all this freedom. There's no there's no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? There's no managing. There's no you know uh, resistance. Trying. Yeah, they're just like it's 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 freeing it up. It's letting it go. There there that you don't have to block anything. You don't have to restrict. Unrestricted is probably the best word I can say. You don't have to restrict your swing anymore because there's nothing restricted. You can let it go. The club face is going to come right back to square. And guess what? You want to hit harder? We get faster. It's just going to go farther. It's not going to go any more offline because the, everything's matched up. So you get to you get to go full green light, let her rip, and it's super fun. So if it didn't, the answer was what surprised me wasn't what his swing looked like because that's how he was designed. What surprised me is that he didn't try to do something different, and he actually said, "Hey, this is me." And that takes a lot in a world of seeing all these pretty pictures to say, hey, it's okay to swing it like this. And I don't have to change who I am because this is how I'm designed. And man, that's, and he's a young kid. He's only like 14 or 15. So, wow. Uh, it's, it's, I think, I think that's why, that's why I think some of the best players are some of the most headstrong players because they have figured out a way they hit it well. Right. And I, I can't, I can't count myself among them because I was a rule follower. So when somebody told me to do something, who was an authority figure, a coach, it's like, okay, I'm going to do this because, hey, you're the expert. I'm going to do it. And I've been like that my my whole life. But some of the best players are the ones who say, hey, I don't hit it well when I do it that way. So I'm not going to let you mess with my, with my motion here. I'm going to do it because I do it this way, right? And and so that that's the kind of player. And I, I kind of... I don't mind when people question what I what I teach. I want you to question what I teach. But I'll prove it to you that this is how you're designed to do it. And then when you oftentimes this is something we hear a lot. Boy, that's how I did it when I played my best. Mm. But that's not what the textbook said, or that's not what this person who was the latest Instagram sensation was talking about. Right? Um, and that's what I'm talking about, all this information out there. It's like, okay, well. This is the hot teacher right now. Let me do what, you know, and, and, and this is his student. So let me try to do, you know, what that player does. And, and then all of a sudden you're going down this road and you know how hard it is. I mean, this game's hard. So we're making it really hard by trying to do something where you're not designed to do. So fire the questions at me. I will answer them to you in a way where you'll understand. It's like, oh, this makes sense. My tagline in my golf instruction is simple, logical instruction because it's simple because it's you and it's logical because when you do what you're designed to do, you can be successful. When you try to do something that somebody else is designed to do, that's when you have to restrict, manage, block, analyze, you know, uh, high maintenance would be a word. Um, that, have you interviewed Bruce Rierigardi, um in another podcast, a putting coach? He should be on your list of people. He's a fantastic putting instructor. Um, and one of the things we do, we do, we co-coach people. I just have them on FaceTime and, uh, and we do, we do some, uh, some lessons together and, um, you know, we measure everybody before they, before they putt. So we know exactly how they're designed to putt. It's the same thing. I mean, putting is not a hard motion if you know how you're designed, but it's super hard. I'll give you a quick example. So my right hand turns out to need to be in a weak position, kind of like Rory's or Ben Hogan. That's how my, we call it a side cover grip. I always used to pull my putts. Well, what was a, what was my, my grip? Well, I put my right hand on the side, like where my palm faces the target. Well, the minute my arm, my hand goes to where it wants to be, which is more turned to my left, that's what's going to happen during the stroke. And I would pull all my of my, you know, short putts that I was trying to make for par. And the minute I turned my hand in the correct position, that pull went away. I, I, I didn't have to manipulate the stroke. 
I mean, I even did a video years ago where I said, hey, you know what? To stop the pull, lead with your left elbow. And, and, and literally it was a block. I was teaching a block because I was trying to get myself to stop hitting it left. And that was a great compensation. Now, I don't have to compensate for that anymore because I'm already biomechanically sound before I start. So I was going to tell you the tiger story. Do you want to do a break or do you want to, can I just keep going? Oh, no way. I, I, uh, first, let me say, yes, Bruce Rerick has been on the show, and I think you introduced me to him. Uh, that was Arnold Palmer's playing partner for yes. years. Correct. Yes. Amazing yes. storyteller. Great storyteller, but even better coach, better putty coach. I mean, the yes. guy, phenomenal. We, it is so funny. Like At the end of every putting lesson, I say, Bruce, you did it again. This person keeps making 10-footers like, like they were one footers. It's just, it's amazing. But all we're doing is we're getting people to do what they're designed to do, whether Bruce is doing it in putting or I'm doing it in the full swing. It's just, we're just making you, you. And if you're you, you can be consistent. So yeah. what, if you go back and look at Tiger's career, what's the best shot he always hit when he was under pressure? We're going to get back to Tiger, but you're right. We do need to take a break. And let me just say, let me just say that Bruce Rurick was on episode 804, definitely worth going back and listening to. And that was from August 3rd, 2021. I mean, we're going to take another time out. We'll be back right after this. All right, well, we just actually this past weekend was the, the PNC Championship. So Tiger was back in our, in our minds and our hearts again this weekend and watching Charlie play. Charlie is like, uh, now he's starting to come into his own, but this, he's a short kid. I, how old? Do you have any idea how old Charlie is? He's 13. 12, 13? He's the same this kid age looks like he's, guy. yeah, this Almost. kid looks like he's been lifting weights. I mean, his, he's got cut I shoulders and stuff. A home gym at the Tiger household. Oh, you think so? You think that they have access to the facility? He doesn't have to go to the local Y? Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you've been wanting to tell, you got a tiger story. Let, let's go well, there. So my tiger story, this goes back to like hitting balls the way you're designed, right? So I asked you the question, so what's the one kind of famous shot tigers hit over and over again in competition that you can rely on every time? What's that shot? Stinger. You got, it's the stinger, Whoa. right? Yeah. I'm never good at these qu- pop I mean, quizzes. It, that was, uh, I mean, I <laughs> expected you to answer that, not just because you're a bright guy, but because that's the shot he always he always hits when he needs to get one in play. He's amazing at that shot. He basically made that shot famous, right? So he's 19 years old. But We're explain playing. what that is. What is the stinger? Well, the, the stinger is uh, <laughs> just the, the little bullet shot. In his case, he likes to usually have it uh, fall a little bit to the right. Okay. It's his edit and play shot. It's his fairway finder. It's yeah. his kind of like go-to shot when, when, you know, a lot of pressure's on. He, I, don't, I don't think in all the years I've watched Tiger and I've watched his whole career, I've ever seen him miss hit that shot. It's like, it's in his DNA, right? It's how he's designed to swing. So I actually practice that shot. You could argue that Tiger is the best iron player of all time or his generation tough to argue against that right you could also argue that tiger relative to his peers was not a very good driver of the golf ball right and if you look at his career if you wanted somebody to get a driver in play you wouldn't pick tiger if you wanted somebody to hit an iron close you'd pick tiger or hit a stinger you'd pick tiger right so when he was 19 years old he had just won the pack back then it was the pack 10s and uh you know Soon we both to be were, again what's that Soon to be again the Pac-10. Yeah, who if knows? It, it, it was is around. Hopefully, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So so um, every year we have an alumni against the team match, and so I luckily got paired against Tiger, and uh, so I'm walking down the fairway, and and I said, hey, listen, what do you do? And again, he was 19 years old. He had just won the Pac-10 championship, shooting like 61, 65 in the 36 hole day, just annihilated the field. I think he shot 80 the last day and still won by like eight or ten strokes. So I said, what, you know, what do you, what do you do when you got to get a ball in play? Narrow par four. He goes, oh yeah, I just take my two iron. I hit a low one, about 260 yards with a little fade. I'm like, that's nice. I mean, back then, you know, whatever that was, 96 or seven or so, or maybe it was 94 or five, whenever that was, he, uh, you know, to hit a 260 yard six iron, I mean, a 260 yard two iron was pretty amazing. 
and to hit it low and still be able to hit it that far. Right? Yeah. Um, but that was his shot, right? And 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 that shot became famous through the years, and he hit it so many times, and he won a British Open barely hitting a driver off the tee. I think it was at Hoy Lake, where he just hit a lot of those stingers around the golf course. So Tiger's got a grip where his right hand is slightly, slightly weak. Not as weak as like Hogan or Rory, but it's slightly weak. But that, if you think about that hand position, which is turned a little bit to the left, it's very biomechanically oriented to hit downward and leftward. To compress something. Not great at hitting up on something. Not a good driver of the golf ball, remember? Um, so so for him, hitting that shot was just like the natural. It wasn't hard for him. It was hard for him to tee up a ball high and hit up on it because of the way his right hand orientation was. So it wasn't natural for him. That's why he struggled with it. Right? If if the 45-inch graphite shaft, super big-headed driver never came into existence and we're still playing with a tailor-made burner, you know, small-headed thing that you barely had to even, you know, put a T under it and just compress it, Tiger would have won 50 more tournaments, right? Because wow. his driver wouldn't have let him down, yeah. right? Because he was he had been able to hit down on his driver, right? Because he's designed to hit down on it better than he's designed to hit up on it, right? But that's just how he's designed, right? Call Martawa, great iron player, hits quite a bit down on it, right? He's designed to hit more down on it. So that's when you when you start to understand who you are and you were headstrong enough to not veer away from that and not get distracted and not go down different avenues. And that's why I say my role is to find what that is for you. That's the way that's the way I see myself. I'm like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be your guide through this adventure we call golf, and I'll make sure you stay in your lane. Right. And then you can really have fun with the nuances of the game. How do I hit this ball off this uphill lie? What adjustments do I have to make to my setup to be able to, you know, lower the trajectory by, you know, 10% to be able to, you know, fight this wind? Or how much more club do I need because it's 50 degrees instead of 75 degrees? Or I'm playing up in Colorado. What's my adjustment, you know, to the, to the altitude? The, the nuances of the game. How's it? Where's my ball going to land on this chip shot? Is it going to go down grain or into the grain? Is it going to skid before it spins or is it going to spin before it skid? I mean, what, what, what's the ball going to do? All these things that help you turn fours into threes, fives into fours that really help you score and play your best golf. We don't spend enough time on that because we're worried too much about how to swing the golf club. And that should be taken care of when you're set up. Getting back to your simulator thing, this is where maybe I'm going to be dating myself and be a little more old school, but golf isn't played off of a flat lie with a camera in your face into a screen. If you're looking to become a better golfer, limit your time in the simulator and spend more time on the golf course experiencing, hey, it just rained yesterday, now it's muddy. What do I do to make sure I catch this golf ball first and don't catch it? Right? Because yeah. it's not going to bounce into the ball like it would be in Palm Springs where it's fur. Right? So... I need to be able to adjust to those situations if I want to become a better golf. If I want to spend my time on a perfect lie on a flat mat, right, hitting into a screen and expect I'm going to get much better at golf, you're going to be unpleasantly surprised when you get to a golf course, right? <laughs> it's like, I can't remember what I was talking about, about this, but it's like, let's say you hit 27 irons into the into the simulator and you got that and you got your track man or you got your quad out and you get your numbers perfect right and then you hit your drive beautifully off the first tee when you go play on sunday and your ball ends up in a divot you got your seven iron to the green but the ball's in a divot now how well are you prepared for that right i don't let my students give themselves perfect lies when they're when they're uh taking a lesson from me just roll it out there now let's play that one Let's change the target. Let's change the lie. Let's change the shape. What are you going to do? Right? That's golf. But hitting into a simulator, we get to this guy, put the ball in the perfect ball position, you know, perfectly flat lie. There's no grass behind my ball. I'm hitting into a screen where it doesn't really matter. Right? Yeah. Well, to me, that's, that's okay. yeah, that, that's the difference, of, you know, that we talk about. I was playing with a guy this weekend that I, you know, just met on the course. And he was complaining about his his golf swing and stuff. And it's like, dude, your swing is fine. You just have to learn how to play golf. I mean, you're all you're talking about is making contact, is is hitting the ball. 
And that's really different than playing golf. Yeah. Um, what a simulator simulator cannot do. It can it can enhance. It can give you the reps to hitting a golf ball, but it's not going to help you play golf. I think. But also, getting back to the question earlier, like, what's your spirit of the game? What are you trying to do? What well, what's yeah. your goal? If you're if it's, I mean, golf ultimately for most of us is just it's a uh, it's a hobby. It's fun. It's like. I like hitting balls into a, you know, I like hitting balls into a simulator. I get to take half an hour off of, you know, being a lawyer and I get to go hit balls into a simulator and, and, uh, and check out my distances or make the ball curve and, and, and have some fun and, and that, but I'm, I'm not trying to become better at golf. I'm just like, this is entertainment for me. Right. It's like you go to the casino in Vegas, right? Some people go there as serious gamblers. I'm not a gambler, but I might take 50 bucks and say, we'll see how long this lasts. And it might last two minutes. It might last all night, but that's it. That was my entertainment. Yeah. Not going in there as a money-making proposition. I know I'm going to get crushed. The numbers are not, not in your favor. But if you're, exactly. if, if you're, you know, there's plenty of, plenty of people who like, they've never been to a golf course. They just hit balls on the range and that's, that's fun and that's exercise. And they're out there with their friends or they're out there like meditating on their own, just, just hitting the ball. And that's fine too. It's their adventure, right? It's their. There's no rule of golf that says, "Well, you come out here, you you need to shoot your best score you can." But, it, and it's it's different for everybody. So, what is that for you? Maybe it is. I just like, hey, I have a simulator in my house because I don't have the luxury of going out to a golf course. My job takes a lot of my time, or my family takes a lot of my time, and like this is my chance to get hit some golf balls. I love hitting golf. Let's hear what's happening on Golf Smarter Mulligans this week. We'll be right back. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans is part two of our conversation with Jim Waldron from 2011 on the top 10 traits of better golfers. The better golfers, the people who get it easily, have the ability to coordinate body parts that are moving in opposite spatial dimensions simultaneously, just like rubbing your tummy and patting your head. We got the vertical dimension up and down. We got the side to side dimension, or they're toward the target or away from the target dimension. That's also called the horizontal dimension in golf. And we got the width dimension, so length, width, and height, right? You know, certain body parts are moving more or less in the vertical dimension, like your wrists are cocking up and down right, in the vertical dimension. Your arms are basically moving mostly up and down in the vertical dimension, and your body pivot is moving in the horizontal dimension. And so we have to learn to coordinate body parts that are literally moving in opposite directions simultaneously. And that's just like rubbing your tummy and patting your head, but much more difficult even than that. And some people just struggle with that because most people's brains want all the body parts to move in the same plane, the same dimension. That's why they're 40 handicappers. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans episode 191 featuring part two with Jim Waldron on the top 10 traits of better golfers. This is the first time this episode has been heard publicly as it was a private memory members only episode when it was originally released and this is a long one please subscribe for free to our sister podcast that revisits the best of the golf smarter podcast called golf smarter mulligans being released every friday from wherever you're listening right now well first of all i want to thank you for referencing various episodes of golf smarter I, that's very <laughs> kind of you. I didn't know that you listened. Well, I, and, or you a, just check titles I, out. Um, I mean, guest on your show, but I'm a I'm a listener as well. I really enjoy the the uh, the people and and uh, you do like I've told you before. You are a great question asker and a good listener. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. That, makes, that makes for a great interviewer. So I appreciate. Well, it. it's it's been amazing to me on how many teachers say that they've been using this show as a resource for learning how other teachers do it. So yeah. that's, that's really flattering, but let's talk about Xander golf, um, and the different, uh, ways to get in touch with you, the different ways that you teach, um, because you do, you don't do it just in person. There's other ways to do this and, yeah, uh, watch, right. follow you. Sure. Sure. Um, well, you can always follow me on Instagram. Um, so I always post things there so you can kind of see what I'm up to. Um, and, and then that's on it, at Xander golf. Um, I think it's, Xander.josh. I think that's what it is. But if okay. you just look at Xander Golf, you'll find you'll find me on there. Okay. Um, and in the profile, there's a link to how you can do online lessons with me if you're not yeah. local. If you're local, come see me at Stanford. It's a beautiful spot and uh I'd love to help you there. And uh, a beautiful golf course. And a beautiful golf course. 
And, uh, but yeah, if you're, if you're somewhere out there in the world listening to the podcast and, uh, you want to get, um, some online instruction from me, um, I'm affiliated with a company called zip.co and in my profile on Instagram, you can find it. And I think I've given you the link for the, if you put it in the show notes, they can, they can look there and there's a, a coupon, um, that they can get a discount on the, on the online lessons there. Um, and in the online lessons, if you sign up for the coaching program, there will be an assessment that you take so I can understand how you're designed. So going back to what we just talked about, because uh, I don't want to just, you know, give you a quick tip if it's not going to be something that's, again, relevant to what you need. I want to make sure that you're getting exactly what you need. And um, there there's a, a chance for you to both send me videos and send me comments on what your ball is doing so I can understand what your ball flight is doing as well. So. Um, there's different programs that you can do, whether you see me once a week or see me, uh, twice a month, you can do either one of those and, uh, kind of help, like I said, guide you through, through your adventure and your journey of, uh, being the best golfer you can be or doing whatever you want to do with golf. But, um, I would highly recommend, um, getting to the point where you understand who you are and, uh, that's my job to help you figure out that puzzle. And it's not complicated for me because it's what I do. It's a lot harder when you don't know what you're supposed to be and you try different things and that's where it gets frustrating. Um, you might get be one of the lucky ones that happen upon something that, that works for you. Uh, and if you do, great. But if you're struggling at all, I can get you on the right track. So that's a great way to find me. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think today the big takeaway for me is find, especially with all this, you all that we're being bombarded with online and in reading and everything, uh, find what applies to you. I think it's a really incredible piece of advice and don't get sucked into everything that you see. Um, thinking in, and don't, and definitely don't get sucked into, I saw it on TV, so I think I can do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it, like it, it's a, it's a needle in the haystack. It just might happen to be that the one thing that you're looking at, that you happen to read that day, hits you and it's like, oh, wow. And and that makes you really hit the ball solidly and straight. And that's fantastic. I can save you the, the, the misery, if you will, of trying to find it by trying all these different things because that's how you can really mess yourself up and even worse, like injure yourself. Because if you try to do, like sometimes I'll demonstrate, okay, this is how you're designed to swing and I'll demonstrate and my back will go, Josh, that was not you. <laughs> that's oh, wow. not what you're designed to do. Um, yeah. And so you, I, I'm very careful when I do that. I'm like, I do it at, at a partial speed because if I ripped it with it with a certain grip and a body position that's not designed for me, I actually will will hurt myself. And maybe at 22 it wouldn't have happened, but at 54 it will. So for those of you who are getting up there in age like I am, um, even more important to to do things that will not preclude you from playing by injuring yourself. So be very be very careful with. Like, um, I, I think that I'll leave you with this last thought. I know we're wrapping up here, but I don't know if I've invested more time in anything else in life than my golf game. My family's only been around for part of my life, but I've been playing golf for 46 years and I put a lot of time and effort into this golf swing. So if somebody's going to give me a piece of advice, they better know what they're talking about before I mess with this investment because it is a pretty valuable thing and i know if you're a golf lover like me and you you love the experience of hitting a solid shot with the right trajectory and the curve like a shot i hit the other day at san francisco golf club my god that shot will live with me forever i was so excited i yelled out and the member said don't yell at san francisco <laughs> 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 like like it's it was such a perfect shot. And I'm like, but if you're somebody who's like that, like me, then then uh, let me help you find what that is for you and you will have so much more fun. And and uh, I mean, golf's fun anyway, but it's even more fun when you hit those shots that are so memorable like that. I will never forget that one. Oh, yeah. I totally get that. Oh, man. Well, listen, buddy, you have a have a happy and healthy new year um and thank you again for all your education and time uh and friendship and 
we will continue to do this as long as we can. And and basically, from where I'm sitting, you're not getting up there in age yet. You're <laughs> still not there. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I appreciate you. I always enjoy coming on your on your podcast, and uh, I look forward to doing it again soon. I want to thank our newest Golf Smarter Ambassador, Ryan Wilden of State and Oregon. Ryan's going to receive a glove and glove storage compartment from RedRoosterGolf.com just for writing in and leaving the voicemail you heard at the opening of the episode. You, too, can win a Golf Smarter gift and have a choice of which you'd prefer. I can't think of an easier way to participate. Send an email to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com and request our simple instructions to leave a voicemail at our toll-free Golf Smarter line. And when you do, you can choose a dozen balls with the Golf Smarter logo from Odin Golf, the golf brand that sponsors and pays everyday golfers. These tour-quality balls are a fraction of the price of what you'll usually pay, and when you use the code GOLFSMARTER at checkout, you'll receive an additional 20% off the order. They're at Odin, O-D-I-N dash golf dot com slash pages slash golf smarter. But wait, there's more. You can choose to receive a private online link to Tony Manzoni's video, The Lost Fundamental. And your third choice, just like Ryan, is a new glove and glove storage compartment from RedRoosterGolf.com, the unique glove subscription service that offers many styles of gloves in 26 sizes. So please send an email and I'll get back to you with some instructions of what to do and what to say. Just write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com. Now, please remember to check out our latest videos on youtube.com at golfsmarter. For each episode, we're now providing the entire episode with just a static image and no video, so you can just listen, or a 10 to 20 minute abbreviated version of the entire episode of us in conversation, and we'll now also be doing YouTube shorts, one minute video tips directly from the episode. I'll leave the link in our show notes, in addition to having the new highlighted video on today's blog post at golfsmarter.com. But please subscribe to youtube.com slash at golfsmarter so that you can be notified of podcast episodes and other videos posted to Golf Smarter TV. And lastly, I want to remind you again that I'm setting up a round of golf in Plantation, Florida for a group of Golf Smarter listeners getting together to play on Monday, January 23, 2023. You'll receive all the details via email when you sign up, but I need to hear from you. If you'd like to play 18 holes with me and some other Golf Smarter listeners, please let me know via email no later than Monday, January 9, 2023. That should give you enough time to figure out your schedule. Again, we're going to play on Monday, January 23rd, 2023. That's 12323, somewhere near Plantation, Florida, and I'd really love for you to join us. As this episode kicks off our 18th year of Golf Smarter, again, I want to remind you, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions for upcoming episodes, please click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com and thank you for your continued support.